What role does the unconscious mind play in a purchase decision? Just a light topic to banter around right after this. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone to The Buyer's Mind, where we investigate exactly what's going on in the brains of our prospects who are considering a purchase decision. And my take on this is if I understand the way that a buyer wants to buy, if I really understand that process, even the unconscious process, then I can structure my sales presentation accordingly. And that's what this podcast is all about. We like to have some fun, though, and celebrate this interesting, wonderful, wacky world of sales along the way. I'm your host, Jeff Shore. You can read the full bio in the show notes, or you can visit jeffshore.com, and you'll have the opportunity while you're there to sign up for our Saturday morning video newsletter, a few minutes of inspiration each Saturday morning. And I'm joined on the show by my producer, Mr. Paul Murphy. Murph, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing really well. How are you? Good, good, good. Hey, uh, Murph, what you're that tech guy. What's 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 the latest in tech that you're seeing out there these days? Yeah, um, you know, being a video guy, Jeff, I got to say that uh, 4K televisions are absolutely amazing because that is the same quality that you get in the movie theater. So, all right, are you telling me I need to go out and buy another new television? Well, here's the bad news: in another year or two. 8K televisions are going to be coming out, so you might want to save your pennies so that your wife doesn't get too angry at with you for buying a TV now. All right. So I have two years to convince Karen that I'm going to need a television. At some point, though, does the picture quality get so good that the eye can't even tell the difference anymore? You know, that is one of the, the interesting questions. Uh, for some people, beyond 2K, color information doesn't really start to, to make any difference. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, I'm not sure how much 4K and 8K really buy you uh, beyond kind of twice the level of what HD is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. All right. Well, we'll watch it carefully, and uh, and see what happens too with the prices as they uh, as they come along. Well, that's all about sort of how the brain picks up color. But now we're going to talk about on today's episode how the brain sorts out unconsciously what's happening in a purchase decision. And coming up in just a few minutes, an incredibly fascinating interview with Dr. Susan Weinschenk, aka the Brain Lady. Dr. Weinschenk is a psychologist who specializes in the area of behavioral economics, that is why people do what they do. And she's going to talk to us about the very process of decision making and how much of that occurs in the unconscious brain. And it's based on some of the latest science on the subject. And here's the promise. When you know your customer well enough, even on a deep level of how their brain works, then that sales path is going to begin to roll out right in front of you. All right, so stay with us because at the end, I'm going to give you some instructions as to how you will be able to enter our launch contest. We've got a contest that's ongoing just for the launch of this podcast with some great prizes. You'll want to stay tuned to that. Our quote of the day, a regular part of each show. This one comes from that world-renowned philosopher, Lily Tomlin. I love this quote. Here's what Lily Tomlin said. I always wanted to be someone. I guess I should have been more specific. Isn't that great? Is that an awesome quote? And it speaks, and albeit in a tongue-in-cheek manner, of the need to really understand what we are trying to do in life. And that's appropriate as we kick off this episode all about knowing our customers and maybe learning a little about ourselves along the way. Hey, I want to tell you that the podcast is brought to you in part by our good friends at Home Street Bank. This is not just a show sponsor. This is also my personal lender of choice. I used Home Street Bank in a home purchase recently, and I have to tell you, it was an amazing transaction transaction, smoothest transaction that I've ever had, and I've purchased a number of homes. Professional, dependable, great rates, great service, and if you are a real estate professional listening today, you just won't find better people to work with in taking care of your clients. And they can do it all. Banking, home loans, credit lines, you name it. Go to homestreetbank.com and you can learn more. That's homestreetbank.com. Com. Before we get to our interview with Dr. Weinschenk, we bring you our sales tip of the day. And today's tip is, how do you remember a customer's name? This is an ongoing issue. I've had to deal with this myself. I've talked to literally thousands of salespeople who have struggled with the same thing. And here's the tip. Repeat it back quickly. 
Now, here's the idea. When you hear a name, you hear it externally. But when you say it, you hear it internally. So when you repeat it back and you do it very quickly, you will greatly increase your retention. And in fact, if you could do it more than once very quickly, you're going to increase the odds further still. So when I meet somebody for the first time, he introduces himself, his name is, my name is Jim. I can say, oh, Jim, nice to meet you, Jim. Thanks for, thanks for being here today. I just said it twice, but in a very quick and conversational way, I'm hearing it internally and it's going to help my retention. I want to tell you, this isn't just a good sales skill. This is a good life skill. So my suggestion is practice this in non-sales environments, at a restaurant, at a company function, the gym, church, wherever you meet people, make it a habit and have some fun with it. Hey, before we get to our interview, let me tell you about an opportunity. I want to invite you to join us for the 2017 Jeff Shore Sales Leadership Summit and Exposition to become a better leader for your career, for your team to grow in ways that you never thought possible and take your career to the next level. Now, this is specifically targeted towards real estate executives, but we've had people outside the real estate industry who've gotten so much out of this. As the premier industry gathering, you're going to learn from the best of the best about what it takes to make you a better leader, a better manager, a better coach, with more insights, with more actionable strategies with more aha moments than ever before. You're going to come away from the summit confident that you possess the tools and the knowledge not only to succeed, but to truly change the world. And I have to tell you one other thing. We do this at the Lowe's Coronado Resort in uh, beautiful, just outside of San Diego. We do it on a Thursday, Friday. Most of our guests, hundreds of guests, spend the weekend. We've done this year after year. They spend the weekend in San Diego. And there are worse places to be in August than San Diego. It's a beautiful city. You're going to come away renewed and refresh. You can find more information about the summit and other exclusive training events throughout the year for sales leaders and for sales pros at jeffshore.com slash events. Well, let's get to our interview. We're really excited uh, to hear from Dr. Susan Weinshank. She's a behavioral scientist, and we'll unpack that in just a moment here. Uh, PhD in psychology. She's the CEO at The Team W. You can go to theteamw.com to see more about that. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin. She consults with Fortune 1000 companies, startups, governments, nonprofits, and she's the author of uh, several books. My favorite, How to Get People to Do Stuff. It's great. Uh, blogger, podcast. Uh, she's a columnist for psychologytoday.com. Uh, High recommend to read her stuff on psychologytoday.com. Uh, but she's also called the brain lady. Uh, and I want to kind of start there. Uh, Susan, you're, you're a behavioral scientist, the brain lady. So let's do it this way. You're at a cocktail party. Someone with a short attention span asks you, what does that mean? How do you describe a behavioral scientist? Well, I'm someone who studies and reads and talks about why people behave the way they do. Okay, uh, fair enough. That's a big subject, and there's a lot to unpack <laughs> it here. Is. Yeah. So, uh, but but it sounds fascinating. How did that spark your interest, and how long have you been thinking why do people do what they do? All right, you want the true story? Yeah, please. The, the yeah, true let's... story is that I had started my college career at Virginia Tech, and then for a variety of reasons, I had to drop out, and I moved to Boston, and I was working during the day and going to school at night. And for, for any of you who've ever done that, it can take forever when you're going to night school because you, you're not always able to take a full load of classes. And I discovered that if I took some of these exams where they would give you college credit, you know, if you could pass the exam, mm -hmm. then I could shorten up my college stay. And uh, when I looked to see what should I take for the exam that I thought wouldn't be too hard, I picked these psychology exams, I read some textbooks and I took the exams and they were much harder than I thought they'd be, mm -hmm. but I did pass. And so then all of a sudden the fastest route out of college was to get a degree in psychology. And mm -hmm. I just kind of shrugged and said, well, maybe I'll do that. And then I fell in love with it. I mean, I loved, I loved the classes and I realized, wow, this is what I want to study. So I did graduate school in um, psychology and then uh, I got out and I taught college and I started my own consulting business. And over time, as I kept reading and learning about all the new stuff, especially the new research on um, the brain and unconscious mental processing, 
I realized that I love I love psychology. I always do, but actually, I love it a little bit broader than psychology because mm-hmm. not just what's going on inside our own heads, but all all about the interactions between people. And uh, you know, so that's behavioral science. It's a little to me, behavioral science is a little bit broader than psychology. And that's kind of how I got into it. Because if you put some perspective on that, if you want to understand the way that people make decisions, you have to look both at the psychology, but also the neurosciences, right? And this is an evolving science. We had Scott Halford on the show, and he said something interesting. He said, when it comes to what we understand about the chemistry of the brain, most of what we know, we've learned essentially in the last 10 years, maybe 10 to 20 years. Uh, but this is really an evolving science. And you, as a as a behavioral scientist, uh, have to understand both sides, right? Both the psychology and the neuroscience of what's going on in the yes, brain. Yes, definitely. And, and um and the person you were talking to is right. It's really been in the last 10 years that we're starting to understand what's going on in the brain and then starting to understand how that impacts, you know, why we do what we do, why we make decisions, uh, why do, you know, why do people decide, for instance, to buy something like, mm-hmm. like what triggers that? Uh, why do they believe some, you know, why do they trust some people and not other people? The whole brain part of it, um, uh, we call it uh, brain and behavioral science because mm-hmm. it's it, the two are definitely linked up together. So I think it's great fun. And I've been, uh, you know, I have so much fun applying this to, uh, you know, not just my own life and what I see around me, but then, you know, to to my clients sure. uh, who, who want to use this information to be smarter uh, about the products and services that that they provide. Is there a a big idea that it, just as we're getting started here that can sum up just it maybe even one key thought that would help a sales professional to understand a little bit more about how their customer makes a, a, a decision? So I'm trying to come up with just sort of this umbrella over the entire conversation. Is there is there a big idea you can throw at us? Well, you know, with with salespeople, what I think is so fascinating is that um, they actually know a lot of all this brain science stuff, but they don't know they know it. So I would think, you know, for the broad umbrella question, I would say um, that most mental processing, most decision making occurs unconsciously. That's like the big, the big thought. And and I and like I said, I think as we start to talk about what that means and what you know, why am I saying that and what's the research behind it, I think the people listening will will say, well, yeah, you know, I knew that. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So, right. um, but they might not know exactly what's going on, you know, with neurons. Right. Uh, so maybe maybe we could tell them why what they're sure. doing is working. You know, I, I I I see that so often when I'm talking to sales professionals, and if we unpack something like dual process theory and start thinking about uh, you know system one and system two, or however it's been described, obviously in many different ways, but uh, they the salespeople see so much of themselves in the description, and then they start seeing their customer in the description, and you can just see yeah. the light bulbs going on. Not and again, as you say, they know it, they just don't know they know it. And so it sounds like your job is really helping them uh, connect the dots, right? Th- these pieces of information are already kind of floating around your brain. H- how do we assemble them all together so that it makes sense, right? Yeah, and I think it also helps because sometimes you've got like, um, you know, again, you may not be able to, dis- to to describe why what you're doing works, um, but you've got maybe, you know, 90% of it right, but there's, for some reason with some people, it just doesn't seem to work and you don't understand why. And so I think the the research on behavioral science and brain science gives you that extra missing piece, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, that's why, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, um, or, you know, why it worked with this customer, but not that customer. 
Right, right. You had said that uh, most of the decision-making processing is unconscious, and I want to unpack that and spend a little time on it, because uh, I saw you on Will Barron's podcast, a, a great episode, by the way. And, uh, it was very fun. It was, well, he's a great guy. He, he, he's, uh, I could listen to him all day long. Uh, <laughs> but it's interesting, because you corrected him, and actually several times, because he continually referred to <laughs> the subconscious, and you were like... Yeah, well, then he started correcting himself. It was very right, cute. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But but I have to tell you, that had a, an impact on me, Susan, because uh, then I had to correct myself afterwards. Every time I thought about or started to speak about the subconscious, I had to look at it and say, no, 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 no. What would, what would Susan Weinstein say? So, so tell us a little bit about that differentiation, because uh, it, the, the natural thought is to say this occurs in the subconscious. You say, no, 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 it occurs in the subconscious. Uh, give us some line of, of uh, demarcation there. Yeah, and I mean, in some, I don't mean to be petty about terminology, mm -hmm. but in some ways, I think this is important because um, the subconscious, uh, the term subconscious is not a scientific term. Mm -hmm. So if you're reading the literature, if you're reading a research study about what, you know, something about the brain, and they want to talk about the fact that a particular aspect, a particular thought, a particular firing, is not in conscious awareness, okay? Uh, they're gonna say it's unconscious. They're not gonna say sub, they're gonna say un. Mm -hmm. and, and in psychology terms, why that's so important is that um, the whole idea of the subconscious, that term comes from Freud. And Freud um, was a psychologist that was working in around the 1930s, 1940s, and it was a time in the field of psychology that um, most of us consider actually not particularly scientific. Mm -hmm. So Freud had some amazing ideas that have impacted not only the field of psychology and behavioral science, but just our our general um, way we talk and think. You know uh, about people and and dreams and uh, relationships, but um, and he had some interesting ideas. Uh, some of them have been borne out by science. Many have not. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of like to distance ourselves <laughs> from that because psychology and behavioral science is definitely a science now with real research and mm -hmm. real rigorous studies. And so if you say subconscious, um, it's like, well, what is that? And what does that mean? Uh, you know, he had um, the ego, the id, mm -hmm. the subconscious. And, you know, you can't research that. Right. So we we don't talk about that in research. Um, I when I came when I started studying the new research that's been the last ten years, I noticed right away that they were using the term unconscious, and so I just decided I was gonna I was gonna adopt that term. So that's mm -hmm. why I kept uh, bothering. Yeah, no, no, it was great. It. it was great. It was great. <laughs> Would you say that the that the unconscious is really the foundation? of system one thinking because we think about dual process theory and you know certainly daniel kahneman's book uh, thinking fast and slow dealt uh, uh, to a tremendous extent especially the early part of the book on dual process but we can go back to you know keith stanovich and even herbert simon and, and looking at dual process theory it, it, it describe dual process theory to us just real quick how this how the systems work and then maybe we can get into how much the unconscious plays in dual process theory yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, Kahneman's book is is so wonderful, um, and and I I love it. I I recommend it all the time. And then sometimes people say to me, oh, "That's kind of a serious book." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a big book. I lo I loved it, but I it might be I guess at times maybe too too academic for some people. But well, I think describes... look, the, the problem with the book is that for, for me, when I, it took me a long time to read it, not because yeah. the, because uh, they were heavy words, but because I had to constantly stop right in the margin, look up and to the right and say, now, how do what how does that apply in all these different areas? To me, it was such yeah. an exploratory book that it took me a long time to read it, but I, yeah, I, loved, I loved every minute of it. Yeah, there's a lot in there. Yeah. But sis, Kahneman says, basically, there are two ways, two types of thinking. System one thinking is the easy, intuitive, automatic, you're not thinking very much uh, mode. And yes, that would be the largely unconscious mode. And then system two is when you're thinking hard, concentrating, focusing, thinking about a particular problem or situation. And that would be the system two mode. 
uh, which would be largely a conscious mode. And uh, what he says is that most of the time, most people are wandering around in system one mode. We're just not thinking that much. And um, so that's part of unconscious uh, mental processing, definitely. But I think there's even more. I mean, there's so much going on. Uh, you know, your, your brain is constantly, constantly processing information. Um, uh, information that's coming in from your vision and your hearing and your sense of touch and and uh, and that's all being processed uh, and filtered and interpreted without you knowing it, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, you know when as we're sitting here and we're talking and I'm I'm in conscious mode right now I'm thinking about what I'm saying and how I want to explain it, uh, but while I'm doing that my brain is actually solving problems that have nothing to do with our conversation you know it's solving problems for the client I'm working with and I mean there's all this. Stuff stuff going on in my brain of which I am totally unaware. And then every now and then uh, your brain decides that this particular thought or idea or piece of information or interpretation should be pulled into conscious thought. And, and then it will bubble up. And there's actually a, a kind of a net, network of different um, brain areas and different neurons um, called the salience network is what the scientists call it. And that's a, um, it's, a, it's kind of a system in your brain that is constantly monitoring all the unconscious information and thought processes and deciding Hmm, I think we'd better bring this one up to conscious awareness. And so if you've ever had, we've all had those aha moments, right? When you're not even thinking about a problem or you didn't even know there was a problem, mm -hmm. right? You're mm -hmm. just like, you know, going for a walk or driving home or whatever it is. And all of a sudden you just get this idea, you know, how, hey, maybe I should call John and tell him about, you know, ABC. Mm -hmm. And well, that's your salience network bringing to consciousness a whole bunch of stuff and mental processing that was going on of which you're totally unaware. So let's put this in the in the context of a uh, here's a consumer walking into a store, a retail center, a sales office of some kind. And system one there is uh, un, on the in the unconscious is picking up everything, uh, light, uh, tone, shading, temperature, smells, sounds, it's just everything is being registered at the same time. It's And the brain, being the amazing machine that it is, is working on all of that stuff, but the overwhelming majority is automatic being relegated into the unconscious. Is there anything that's triggering system two? Is there anything that's triggering the conscious? It, it, or, or is it just some, some matter of it has to stand out? Or is it more tied to their motives when they walk through the door? H how do we know? Is there a way to know what's going to get kicked up into system two? Well, um, you can yes and no. I mean, there are definitely um, uh, things that you can do that will actually kick someone into system two mode. So essentially, you know, you're wandering around in system one mode, but if anything becomes too difficult, then system one mode just like, well, I can't handle that. I mean, Kahneman did some of his, and you may remember this from, from reading the book, you know, if you're reading something in a font that is hard to read, mm -hmm. You know, like it's the, the text is hard to read for mm -hmm. some reason. Mm -hmm. That'll actually kick you into system two mode and you'll start thinking about it more deliberately mm. um, just because the font is hard to read. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, and a lot of times you're kicked into system two mode when, um, you know, let's say that you've been trying to solve a problem. You're trying to solve a problem at work and now you're meeting with the salesperson who's telling you about, um, Oh, maybe uh, a, tra a new training program they have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you're kind of half listening right. <laughs> and half right. not and thinking about, you know, what you're going to order for, for lunch. Right. And, um, but there's something that, that, that the salesperson might be saying that all of a sudden uh, your unconscious realizes, hey, wait, that might solve that problem you have 
with team dynamics. So it might just be tied to relevance, just how relevant are the words that are coming out of the salesperson's mouth yes. to my situation at any given time? It might be. Mm -hmm. And it might, but then there might be things like, um, you know, your salesperson might remind you unconsciously of your brother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe you like your brother or maybe you don't like your brother. <laughs> and all of a sudden now, right, there's these, your unconscious is going, I don't think I, I don't think I trust this guy. I don't like this guy. And then you might come into conscious thinking, you know, I, I don't think I, sh I'm not ready for, to, to make this purchase. So that's why it's so t difficult because there's all this stuff going on, right? Under the surface right. that not only do you as a salesperson not know about, the person doesn't even know about. Well, yeah, and I, now you're getting into, I, I'm about halfway through Robert Cialdini's new book, uh, Persuasion, and and so much of it focuses on, you know, that, that on the context, on framing, on the physical location, and all of these yeah. things that we don't give any, any conscious credence to, but boy, it is really pretty profound. But one thing that I, uh, that I thought very interesting about what you were just saying was that if I'm a customer, if I'm shopping for something, I'm talking to a salesperson, as long as that salesperson and is talking to me, I may or may not be in system two mode to what they are saying, and it might largely depend on, on how relevant it is to my situation. But if the salesperson is asking me questions that require uh, me to really think about the answer, I have to be in system two mode. I have to be operating out of that fully conscious state. Uh, I can't talk out of system one. System one is unconscious, right? That's correct. Yeah. And you know, so there's, there's good things about that and there's bad. So one of the things that, um, that I think is really interesting about how the brain makes decisions is that basically, if you're making what's called a goal-directed or value decision, right, mm -hmm. which is a system two decision, I'm thinking, you know, is should I buy this product or that product? Or is this the right time for me to make this purchase? Or do I think this is really worth the money, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, all those kinds of things, which are system two, you know, conscious, deliberative thought. But there's another kind, which is a habit-based decision, which is, uh, for instance, this is um, what, I believe, you know, brand loyalty is based on, right? You know, I, I always buy from from these guys, you know, or I always buy this brand. It's just what we do. Um, you know, that's what we're gonna do. So those two kinds of decisions, a habit-based decision um, is is a, a system one automatic, un, largely unconscious decision. Mm -hmm. And then the, the system two, you know, goal-directed decision, those actually occur in different parts of the brain. And the interesting thing the research is telling us is that those parts of the brain cannot be active at the same moment. Hmm. Right. So you're, you're either making a goal-directed decision or you're making a habit decision. Now, in the example you gave where, you know, you're giving all this information out, right, and you're stimulating system two deliberative thinking, if this person always, you know, typically always buys and always places an order for 10 every three months. And you're talking to them and giving them information and kicking them into system two thinking, that might screw up the order. <laughs> you might not want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, this <laughs> right? so this could happen. You keep them in the system one yeah. habit you know, right, mode. right. You kick them into system two. Who knows what might happen? Right. right? Uh, this could happen. I would suspect. All over. <laughs> sure, sure. In any sales presentation where the customer is effectively already purchased in their brain, and now the salesperson is adding unnecessary detail, uh, they. Boy, we, we could really scuttle our uh, our whole presentation. <laughs> right. Uh, we're just about out of time, but and which is a weird thing to say before I ask this question. But can you talk about the role of emotion in the decision making process? Definitely. Yeah. So, so you have first of all, our, the research shows us that in order to make a decision, you have to have emotion. People will not. Um, the neuron that fires that makes them say, I am now buying, will not fire if there is no emotion. So they need some kind of emotion. And it could be anything. I mean, it can be happiness or it can be frustration or something, mm -hmm. anger. They have to feel something in order to make the decision. So emotion is really, really important. And it's almost more important that you have emotion than worrying about what the emotion is. 
Uh, it's, it's just so critical. I, and I, I was, I'm trying to remember where I was reading this. I, I, I can't recall off the top of my head, but the study of people who's, who had suffered brain injuries uh, that really affected their emotional senses and asking these people to make a decision was essentially impossible. They couldn't do yeah, it. Yeah, they couldn't they, make any decisions at all. Yeah, it just locked yeah. them up. Now, and, that, and that really sort of flies in the face of when we think, well, I'm, you know, the buyer is, a, is really more of an engineer type. They're, they're, they're all logical. They don't. They don't use their emotion. You look at that and say, "No, nah, that's bunk." No. Yeah. Totally untrue. Mm -hmm. They. Everybody. Every. Unless they've had the brain damage you mentioned. Everybody's using emotion to make decisions. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, boy, I, I don't know how your feelings is, but right now I'm feeling like we just sort of scratched the surface, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to need to do this again at some point, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Good. Fantastic. And uh, uh, Susan, you could be reached uh, through your website, theteamw.com, and I know you've got the podcast and the blog. It's all there at theteamw.com, yes? Yep, it is. All right. Uh, just fantastic stuff. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, Murph, I'll tell you, I, I could talk about that all day long. I find this stuff so fascinating. And uh, Susan Weichink is uh, clearly an expert at what she's uh, talking about. What, what, what are you thinking right now? It was so deep. I was really amazed. But I was wondering, can you help me go a little bit deeper in understanding uh, the dual process theory? Yeah, it's it's really fascinating stuff. I, I find it so interesting when we think about how much of our brain works in the uh, unconscious, or as uh, Scott Halford had called it on, on episode one, the non-conscious. But the point is that it's not conscious. It's not something that we are thinking about. So the brain, we, we start thinking here, when we think about thinking, uh, that's what we would call system two in dual process theory. It's the conscious thought. Right now, if you're listening to the description of what dual process theory is, you're listening with your system two brain. That doesn't mean that the rest of your brain is shut off. Your system one, that unconscious or non-conscious part of your brain, is still taking everything in. It's monitoring everything around you. It's it's measuring the sound of the air conditioning in the room that you're in right now. It's measuring the room temperature. Your system one brain is 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 telling you take your next breath and now exhale, right? So if your system one brain was conscious, you, you'd go stir You just couldn't because you'd spend your whole day going breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Right. So this is the idea: is that that system one takes everything in and. It decides, with a very thin filter, it decides whether it's important enough to elevate it into the system, too. And I think one of the ways to look at this, this is a really fun way to look at it. If you've ever been driving somewhere, and you got to a red light, and you looked around, and you said to yourself, I have no idea how I got to this place right here. But I cannot begin to remember the last five minutes of my life. And you're thinking, is there a dead body in the road behind me somewhere? Now, look, it's not like you were driving up on curbs or running over animals. Your system, too, was occupied. You were talking uh, on the, the hands-free phone. Uh, you were thinking about something intense. Or maybe it was just the radio was playing, and you're just like, you're, you're driving along. Players got to play, 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 play. Whatever it is, your system, too, is occupied. Your system, one, is driving. And it's on automatic thought at that point. And so we actually do this all day long where we go through that process. Now, from a buyer's perspective, this is where, to me, it gets really, really interesting. Because if you are a buyer, if you are shopping, if you are trying to make a decision, how much of that contemplation is done in system one? How many decisions are you making in an unconscious or non-conscious way? And the fact of the matter is, uh, most of them, unless a salesperson comes along and helps you to make those more conscious. Because when a salesperson is asking the right questions, then it, it draws that customer out of their system one and into their system two that's really when the decisions become much firmer and much stronger in the customer's mind. Did, did that make sense there, Murph? It did. Can you explain one other thing to me, though? Sure. When we talked about it, we talked about uh, the salesperson moving someone from a system one to a system two and scuttling their sale. How does that happen? <laughs> well, the, the emotion resides 
in the system one. We typically don't spend a lot of time in our system two saying, I feel happy, or I feel nervous, or I feel afraid, or I feel excited. These are all emotions that we're carrying around and they are uh, moving us forward, even on our decision making, because as uh, Susan pointed out, and rightly so, that decision is going to be made emotionally supported logically. So the logic is just sort of the ticket to the dance. If the logic doesn't make sense, it's difficult to, to make a, a, a decision to move forward. We are going to make that decision emotionally. So if my emotion is saying, boy, this feels right, it's saying it on a, on a, on an unconscious or a non-conscious level, this just feels right to me. If that's what my system one is telling me, but now as a salesperson, now I'm going to come back and say, well, let me tell you about all these great features. Let me engage your system two by telling you about the rating on this and the quality on that and what Yelp says about this and how long we've been in business over here and the story of our company. Now I'm trying to feed all of this system two data that is highly logical, and I'm going to take that customer away from their otherwise emotional impulse. And now I'm just confusing things. When we move away from our emotion, it becomes very difficult to make a decision. So how does a salesperson know when they're pushing somebody from their system one into their system two so that you're scuttling your sale? How do you avoid that? Boy, that's a really, really important question. And when we figure this out, it, it, it changes everything. Because ultimately, you have to ask yourself, as a sales professional, who is this for? So the more I'm thinking that the sale is about the product, then the less likely it is that I'm going to be in tune with my customer's emotional basis. But if I'm looking and saying, no, no, the sale is about my customer and about solving the customer's problem, if I am intensely aware and driven towards the idea that my job here is to solve my customer's problem, then you'll be able to read that in a very, very powerful way. And you will know when that customer has turned that emotional corner. When I look at it from this perspective, the interesting situation that we see that plagues so many sales presentations called feature dumping. If you're in the sales world, you know about feature dumping. It's the oversharing of features. Feature dumping is always caused by the same thing. There's always the same root cause, and it is not knowing your customer well enough. You wouldn't feature dump to your sister or to your best friend. We feature dump because we don't know our customer very well. But when I know my customer really well, and particularly when I know them very well emotionally, then I am in tune. We are on the same emotional page, and I'm going to be far less likely to hit into those detail points of System 2 because I'm connecting with them on System 1. So it's heady, but it's real. It's very, very real. If we miss that emotional connection, we're in, we're in sad shape. we got big problems right there. Well, thanks for helping me understand that better. I love that. I I, I loved that uh, uh, Dr. Weinchek really pointed it from the idea that these are things that we know, we just don't know that we know. But when we look at it from the perspective, and I, th that, that big idea that most processing is unconscious or non-conscious, if I can look at it from that side, then it causes me to be deeply interested in what's going on in the psyche of that customer. Really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, my thanks to Dr. Susan Weinschenk for sharing her knowledge with us today. Well, as we head into the wrap up, I just want to just challenge your motivation and ask you this question. Why do we do what we do? This is really the core of motivation. Why do we do what we do? It's an interesting question because sometimes when we're really frustrated in life, we ask the question, why do I do what I do, right? But I'm asking you to reframe that and to ask it in a completely different way, in that contemplative, introspective way. Why do I do what I do? We have to find our why? And here's a great test for your why. Ask yourself the question, what lasts? What will outlast you? Legacies are about what lasts. Look, the money, it doesn't last. Awards, temporary. If you want to ask why you do what you do, I'm going to give you a hint. It will probably have something to do with your impact on the people around you. That lasts. 
That makes a difference. Why do you do what you do? Take a little time, a little introspective time to sit down and contemplate what that means and how you identify your core motivation. All right. Hey, at the beginning of the show, I told you that we're running an ongoing contest related to the launch of the Buyer's Mind podcast. And I'm going to tell you, you have the chance to win Bose Quiet Comfort 25 acoustic noise canceling headphones. These things, if you've never heard it before, they're absolutely amazing. I, I, I love these when I'm traveling, when I'm listening to a podcast, or when I want great quality music that blocks out the noise around me. And for the winner, you can take your choice of either the over-the-ear or the noise-canceling earbuds. Now, I listen to these, and I love these so much that I actually own both. So when I'm working out, I listen to a podcast, I listen to music, whatever it is, and it's a fantastic experience. So we're going to give away a pair of both headphones, but I'm also giving away several Shore Consulting swag bags. That's five of my books, a coffee mug, my motivational CD, and a bag to carry it all in. And all you have to do is download all of the Buyer's Mind episodes on iTunes and subscribe to the podcast and then leave a quick review. It's not difficult. It'll, it'll only take you about 30 seconds. When you've done that, go over to jeffshore.com slash podcast and click on the contest link. It'll just ask you for your email address and the name that you used when you wrote the review on iTunes so that we can pick the winners from there. And we're going to give away 10 of the Shore Consulting swag bags. And then remember that grand prize, your choice of either the Bose Quiet Comfort 25 acoustic noise canceling headphones or the Quiet Comfort 20 noise canceling earbuds. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. I hope you enjoyed that. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. Until next time, go out there and change someone's world. Oh,